We will now continue with the presentation of the day. Mrs. Keisha Bryan from the United States is in charge of delivering the next presentation entitled Maslow Before Bloom, Embracing Courageous Conversations in TESOL Spaces and Beyond. Mrs. Keisha Bryan is an Associate Professor of Education and Interim Chairperson in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. Woohoo! <laughs> she earned a master's in TESOL from State University of New York, Stony Brook, and a PhD in TESOL, bilingual education from the University of Florida. She is a former public school English language arts and ESL teacher. Dr. Bryan has served on the editorial advisory boards of the TESOL Journal, Literacy Research, Theory, Method, and Practice Journal, and the Caribbean Educational Research Journal. In addition, she is an English language specialist for the U.S. Department of State and current director on the TESOL International Association Board of Directors. So let us please welcome Mrs. Bryan. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Perfect, so I'm gonna pull up my file. Thank you all for bearing with me. This is the first time that I am using StreamYard. I am loving it, so thank you so much. Let's see, share my screen. Okay, can you see my presentation now? Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Thanks for attending this talk entitled Maslow Before Bloom, Embracing Courageous Conversations and TESOL Spaces and Beyond. Before I get started, I'd like to thank the leadership of Costa Rica TESOL for this invite, and especially Professor Ana Madrigal Ramola for taking care of the logistics and answering my millions of questions as I learn about your amazing organization and its membership. I'm excited to discuss ways that we can approach, embrace, and benefit from courageous conversations as we reinvent meaningful trends in language teaching. In this talk, I will actually address or talk about how we address the societal elements in language classroom. And I'm sure that in this session, we have teachers, professors, uh, students, and organizational leaders. And so as we go through this presentation, I want you to think, I want you to think about how we address societal elephants in the language classroom. Creativity and international perspectives are a focus of this year's convention. So today's presentation will focus on taking a look in the mirror, okay, or sweeping around our own front doors, as my grandmother would say, as we assure that we are affirming the diversity of our students and the English language teaching workforce. I like learning from you and your experiences and your situations in your context even more than I enjoy imparting knowledge. As such, I will pose questions for reflection and answer, and I will only use the time that is needed to share the information that I have to date. So this journey for this presentation will include um, information about the TESOL International Association. It will include my story, who I am, and how I got to where I am. We will talk a little bit about Maslow and Bloom. Um, we will have courageous conversations, I'm hoping. I'm not sure about this particular context. I'll see how we can do that. And then I'll talk about what's happening in the U.S. context the TESOL International Association's stance on what is happening 
um, not only in the U.S. context, but globally. And then we'll look in our own mirrors. We'll look at ourselves to see exactly what is happening in our classrooms and our um, context with our policies and with our procedures regarding English language learning and English language teaching. And then we'll end with concluding recommendations and discussions. So a little bit about the TESOL International Association. I come to you as Keisha, we'll talk about my identities later, but I come to you as a representative of the TESOL International Association. TESOL is a membership community of 13,000 English language teachers and other professionals. Um, there are more than 170 countries represented in its network. We work with more than 120 local and global English language organizations. We have a number of communities of practice that include our interest sections and our professional learning networks. As English language teaching professionals, we are your one-stop shop for professional development, research, and resources regarding the community as well as global advocacy. As one of two new members of the TESOL International Board of Directors, my term began on March 2023, so I'm fairly new. So this is my first keynote as a board member. My election to the Board of Directors was especially significant and heartwarming because I'm only the third African-American or Black American woman to be elected to the board in its 57-year history. And for some context, board members are elected every year. I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to become involved in the TESOL International Association. I love to give credit where credit is due. And I realize that I stand on the shoulders of giants. So I pay homage to all of my fellow board members, especially those who came before me. But I especially want to pay homage to, to two African-American women who are phenomenal English language teaching professionals who have paved the way for diverse peoples and diverse voices to be seen and heard in leadership capacities within the association. I will share the work that we have done a few slides from now, but they are Mary Romney Shaw who served from 1999 to 2002 on the TESOL International Board of Directors, and Dr. Ayana Kupa, who served from 2020 until 2023 on the TESOL Association, International Association Board of Directors. So now my story, how, do I, how did I enter this TESOL space? It is important to tell the story of how I entered this profession and my life's work in the English language teaching space. You see, to share where I am in my work without sharing my background and how I entered this space would be quite disingenuous. My experience is growing up happily impoverished, and I say happily impoverished because when you are poor, sometimes you're very happy and you don't even know that you're poor or impoverished, depending on your particular context. So I was happily impoverished in a country with a clear class system that was often race-based. And I spoke a dialect that made me a target for linguistic discrimination. However, these experiences, they brought me to this place and it provided lots of context for my career. I am a child of the 70s and 80s. I don't want to date myself. I grew up in coastal South Carolina in the United States in a working class to poor Black family. And when I say poor, I don't mean poor in terms of culture. I mean poor in terms of financial needs. Coastal South Carolina is important to the cultural history of the U.S., as it was the point in which enslaved Africans, my ancestors who were very linguistically diverse, they were dropped off and sold to the highest bidder. Research suggests that most blacks who are descendants of slaves 
have connections to the sea islands off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. And this again is a part of my story. In this pitch, these pictures, you'll see uh, the structure where my family, you'll see my family. You'll see my me and my mother, me and my father, my great grandmother, who I, I never met, who was just about one generation away from slavery, right? And I never had the opportunity to meet them. And then you'll see a most current cultural celebration. So the cultural and linguistics ties that were there during slavery, they still exist. And we'll talk about how um, that is a part of my story. I mentioned the unique culture of the sea islands of coastal South Carolina. With a unique culture, often comes a unique language or a unique dialect. So if you would think about those in your particular context who may be from an indigenous background, or from a racially minoritized background. See, I grew up speaking three varieties of English. The dominant variety, which has been termed standard, the so-called standard English, and then African American English, African American vernacular English, or Ebonics, which is spoken by the vast majority of African Americans in the United States. And then I grew up speaking Gullah, or Gullah Geechee, it's a variety of English that is only spoken by Blacks on the sea islands off the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And what we have here in this picture, just so that you'll see, is that we have a picture of uh, the title of two books, the South Carolina, um, the St. Helena Island, Gullah, the voice of an island, and Gullah is the actual language. Then you have Africanisms and the Gullah dialect, because much of the dialect um, was comprised of Africanisms or African words, okay? And then you have a more current picture of the flags of the Gullah people. And this is how we tend to, um, we tend to uh, kind of promote our history by making sure we have the flags of the people of African descent. And then you have a, 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 a document here that says, nothing be wrong with the way I be talking, right? And that's typical African-American vernacular English. Nothing be wrong with the way I be talking, right? And so obviously most language teachers would say, oh, that's grammatically incorrect. But for African-Americans, it's a part of who we are. It is our language and it's system systematically strong. So here I have a map of the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida where the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritor, Heritage Corridor is and where the Gullah Geechee people survive and live and thrive to this day. And one of my articles about on being Gullah Geechee, a story of my identity, reconciliation, and linguistic love. I believe that it was during my high school years when I became fully aware of just how different and beautiful the Gullah language is. It was also during that time that I came fully aware, became fully aware of what W.E.B. Du Bois termed double consciousness. I was a high achieving student who had a broad social circle, but it became quite evident that students like me were not standard bearers of language. I quickly realized that my language was stigmatized. The way that I spoke English was very stigmatized and that in order to be successful, I had to quickly um, be able to learn and use the language of the dominant group. That was the language of power, but it was also the language of oppression, right? So after viewing a TED talk by a fellow St. Helena Islander, I'm from a place called St. Helena Island, um, years ago, I realized that my experiences as Gullah Geechee was not an anomaly. I now revel in my Gullah Geechee pride and I promote linguistic self-love amongst groups whose languages are marginalized. In the context of my classroom, I tend to parallel my experiences learning standard American English as a second dialect to that of emergent bilinguals who are learning English. When I teach applied linguistics, I use examples from Gullah. When I teach TESOL methods courses, I discuss methods of teaching students who speak minoritized varieties of English. Um, like African American vernacular English, like Gullah, like the Englishes of the Caribbean. I share the ways that racism 
and hegemonic linguistic ideologies operate as two sides of the same coin within the English language teaching profession. And it is my hope that through my story and the stories of other bi-dialectal and bilingual scholars that teacher educators and K-12 language and literacy teachers can enact an anti-racist language pedagogy that highlights identity as a significant construct in language learning, as well as the research, and acknowledge that linguistic identities are multiple, they're subject to change, and they are also a site of struggle. I utilize Black languages like Gullah and African American vernacular English as subjects of linguistic study and inquiry. And I understand that you may not be familiar with Gullah or African American vernacular English, but think about your particular context and what um, the marginalized languages are. Think about your context and who the, and consider who the marginalized peoples are. I critically interrogate white ling linguistic hegemony and anti-Black linguistic racism. And in my work, I promote linguistic justice as a type of social justice. So I utilize the scholarship and language teaching materials that are written by Indigenous people of color, um, also in the context of language and literacy classrooms. So I tend to use my history and my experiences in order to teach and facilitate language learning as well as teacher development. So just a little bit about my current teaching context. As Professor Anna mentioned earlier, I am a professor of education, English language education at the Tennessee State University. That's in Nashville, Tennessee. If you know anything about Nashville, it is actually coined Music City. It's the music city capital of the United States. Um, so there's a lot of music going on. My context is also unique because it is a historically black university. In the context of the United States, there are 102 historically black colleges or universities. Um, these universities were found because there was discrimination and black Americans or African Americans could not get accepted to other universities or predominantly white institutions. And so um, African-Americans decided to build their own universities. And those universities today are very diverse, um, but they still exist. I work in the College of Education and I primarily, again, work in teacher preparation. So the first picture you see is that of Tennessee State University where my current teaching context is. And then you see, um, you know, three, four, four fabulous, five fabulous um, ESL teachers uh, who currently went through our uh, bachelor's degree program, and now they're teaching English to um, emergent bilinguals. Oftentimes, we don't want to address the elephant in the room, right? And that elephant in the room um, is race, it's religion, it's often language ability, it's often disabilities. Um, and I usually tell my, my students that their potential is more than can be expressed within the bounds of their race or ethnic identity. I continuously want to affirm their identities as they are learning English. And that wonderful quote is by the tennis player, um, African-American tennis player, author Ash. Again, a little bit more about the context. My research, um, to contextualize my research, it is basically to affirm, inspire, and empower English language teachers as well as English language learners. And so if you do a Google search on the work that I do and the articles that I've published, they tend to surround themselves or talk about culturally sustaining language pedagogies, right? Those teaching practices that are culturally sustaining for our students. We want to make sure that that's important. So teaching, using a context, using a pedagog pedagogy that's culturally sustaining. And then I focus a whole lot on language acquisition and intersectionality, right? 
thinking about our multiple identities and how those identities intersect and how they impact language acquisition. Um, my work is centered also around critical pedagogies, um, being critical about our teaching, what materials we're using, who we are um, employing as teachers and recruiting as teachers, um, as well as language weaponization, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And um, my purpose, my one of my purposes is to call out injustices. I believe that it's so important as a teacher, as a researcher, and as a community activist for immigrant children and children who have been minoritized and families that have been more minoritized in the context of the United States, that I call out these injustices when I see them and that I actually initiate those courageous conversations that I hope will um, help to make a change. So we go back to one of my favorite, favorite memes. In teaching, you can't do the bloom stuff until you take care of the Maslow stuff. You cannot do the bloom stuff until you take care of the Maslow stuff. And I'm gonna stop right here one minute. Let's see. To make sure that there aren't any questions or comments. Feel free to actually share questions or comments. I can't see them right now, but um, this is one of my favorite favorite, favorite quotes, because I think both Maslow and Bloom are extremely important. Our children need to Maslow before they can bloom. And when I think of blooming, I think of blooming like a flower. And so Benjamin Bloom and his educational theory is about those objectives that we tend to have, um, that we focus our teaching strategies on right? It's like how you teach. It's knowledge at the base, and then there's understanding. We want to make sure that our students understand the language. We want to use the language in terms of teaching content in a lot of cases. We want to make sure the language is grammatically correct. We have activities in the language classroom where they actually apply this knowledge that they're learning from us. Um, we want to make sure that they're able to use the language um, the English language in this case, in order to um, provide an analysis for, for the information or the context that we're, for the situation that we're providing them. We want them to be able to think critically so that they can synthesize and also um, evaluate, right? And so I think we would say that the Bloom stuff is extremely, extremely important, that those are your teaching strategies, critical thinking skills, using language in order to learn, right? And so that's very important. However, Maslow is just as important, right? Abraham Maslow in the 1940s, I think in the 1950s, came up with this, um, this, this uh, he's a, a psychologist, came up with a motivation for improvement kind of chart. And we generally use this triangle when we talk about the needs of our learners, the needs of anybody, right? We have physiological needs. Those are our survival type things, air, water. We all need air in order to live. We need water, we need food, we need shelter, we need sleep, we need clothing, and we know that it's important to reproduce. That's how we survive, right, as a species. And then we have those safety needs, right? Personal security employment, resources, health, and property. And then going up, we need love and belonging. We, we, we're not an island unto ourselves. We need friendship. We need intimacy. We need family. And we need that sense of connection. Our students need friendship. Our students need family, and they need a sense of connection, right? And they need those professionally intimate relationships where they have a relationship with their teacher one-on-one, -on -one, where they can talk to their teachers about anything that might be happening to them, that might be impacting their learning of the language, right? And then they also need respect. As teachers, our responsibility is also to encourage them to make sure they have self-esteem as they're learning the language. 
right? And they have some status. We recognize what it is that they're doing that's right, even, even as we correct them, okay? We provide them the strength they need in order to learn language. We give them freedom to learn that language so that they can self-actualize and become um, who they want to become, okay? And think about this in the context of language teaching and language learning, especially that esteem, so the esteem, right, part, and then the love and belonging, right? As we think about how we can actually, um, we can actually incorporate Maslow before we actually focus on Bloom or as we focus on Bloom, it's important to have those courageous conversations. One of my uh, mentors would say, there is no, there is no Bloom. Students who can't learn if they are not comfortable in the setting in which they are learning, right? As teachers, uh, we've learned a whole lot of great information here at this convention. We have learned a whole lot of strategies. We have been provided tools that we can take back to our classrooms. Um, we have listened to a lot of the publishers provide us information, great information. But it takes us in order to set the environment and the stage in order to love on our students for them to effectively learn, right? And so we have to be willing also to have those courageous conversations with one another as colleagues, right? To make sure that our environment is set up for learning. Um, I want to also put out there that especially within the context of the United States, um, you know, our classrooms are a microcosm of society. They're microcosms of society. And so basically, much of what is happening happening in society, whether or not we believe it, it's impacting our students, okay? And so while we still have a way to go as an association, TESOL International Association, I applaud TESOL International for encouraging courageous conversations through sessions and like this one, um, panels during the international convention that we just had in Portland, Oregon in March of 2023. The program for these conferences looked drastically different than it did 10 years ago um, with regard to meshing both social issues that impact English learners and ELT professionals who are from groups that have been historically marginalized, right? So at one point, he saw we only focused on strategies for language teaching. We never hardly focus on social issues, but we have to understand that those issues also impact our membership. They impact the students who we serve and their families, right? We have to also remember that we cannot, or always remember that we cannot address the Bloom stuff until we address the Maslow stuff. And so generally speaking, when we have these courageous conversations, there are four agreements. We must stay engaged, okay, when we have courageous conversation. We must be willing to experience discomfort. We must speak our truths. And we must accept and expect non-closure. So when we're having conversations about religion, when we're having conversations about race, when we're having conversations about culture and the context of the classroom and the context of society and the context of a diverse society, where we clearly have um, social injustices, we must stay engaged. We must be able to experience discomfort and speak our truth and accept non-closure. And a 2020 article that I wrote with J.P. Gerald, one of the quotes that we would always use, and this goes back to having those um, courageous conversations so that we can get to the point where our students are comfortable and where our English language teacher and professionals are comfortable, we, we acknowledge there can be no reconciliation or restoration without the acknowledgement of truth. Whatever those truths may be about what is happening in your society. And we have to kind of have those conversations, even within the context of the language classroom or our workspaces.
And so there are generally two, I'm gonna outline um, a few issues that we have been having in the context of the United States. And it's just not unique to the United States, it's unique to the entire world because what we tend to do is we tend to put English on a pedestal. We understand the importance of English to providing empowerment for um, our students. Um, but we have to understand that there can also be a weapon of, weaponization of language. And that's important for us to understand, right? And so um, one of the quotes that I like to use is that even the slightest differences in language use can correspond with biased beliefs of speakers. And so it's super important that we uh, understand that. So one of a video clip, I think I'm going to be able to share this video clip. Um, I follow this teacher on uh, Instagram and she tends to post a lot of videos about language and about the teaching profession. And so of course you're going to use less formal language because you're on social media. And so she as a black person would get a lot of comments about the language that she uses. So I'm going to play this clip really quickly. Hopefully we can all hear it. Let me tell y'all something. I get comments like this all the time and I'm sick of it. I'm sorry, but if you can't use correct pronunciation and proper English, you should not be teaching. You're funny and I love watching you, but you're teaching by example when they listen to you every day mispronounce words. Do better. Hey, Oma. It's called code switching, best friend. If you can't code switch or you don't know what code switching is, just say that thing. But no one uses proper grammar at all times, especially not on social media. So I'm going to continue to code switch. People are going to continue to leave comments like this, and I'm going to continue to code switch because it shows that you don't know how. So interestingly enough, the, the poster, this young lady, she actually talks about code switching and how important it is to code switch. But when she doesn't code switch, if she can't code switch, then, you know, the, the language can be weaponized. And what happens is people discriminate based on the type of English that a person is speaking. People will discriminate because you're a non-native speaker of English. And so in those contexts, English is definitely weaponized. And so when I talk about language weaponization being an issue, I first define it. Language weaponization is the process of using language to harm or manipulate others, right? And this can be done through a variety of means, right? Language weaponization can have a significant impact on individuals and societies. It can be used to justify violence, to suppress dissent, to divide people along lines of race, ethnicity, religion, or other factors, right? Um, people could not get jobs because of the type of language or English that they speak. There are a number of ways that English is weaponized. So the question is, whose English is right and whose English is wrong, right? And I want you to think about that whose English is right, and whose English is wrong. And you can actually substitute the word English with any language because every language has various varieties. Let me tell y'all something. I get comments like this all So the second issue, number two, is the assault on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, this is within the context of the United States. Um, and you see, I have a map here of states where DEI, and that's diversity, equity, and inclusion legislation has been introduced, has been approved, or has failed. Okay. A growing number of states have introduced legislation that restrict, would restrict or ban diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives um, at public colleges and in K-12 schools, and in society in general. There are currently more than 30 bills across this country, the United States, targeting DEI funding, practices, and promotion at schools. And as of June 19th, six 
have six states have signed into law um, certain bills that actually restricts diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, why does this matter to English language teachers and especially those around the world? Well, because it often impacts students and their families. And I think you can learn what not to do as a, as a country by watching the United States. I know people tend to think, you know, we have it together here, but we don't necessarily have it together, right? These laws and legislation are impacting immigrant students and their families. It often impacts the teaching of true histories and social issues within the context of the language classroom. And it impacts diversity, equity, and inclusion funding that assists with professional development for English language teachers, as well as the relationship between universities and school systems. So um, the assault on DEI in this country is, is very interesting. And right now, last week, Florida passed an initiative where um, you know a lot of the immigrant population, especially those undocumented individuals, are actually leaving the state to go into states that are a bit more um, friendly and will be providing them the opportunities to integrate into the state um, financial and social systems. So the assault on DEI is another um, issue that's an interesting issue to watch because it impacts language teaching and language programs. So the T TESOL Diverse Task Force, um, you know, came about because TESOL International Association has decided to acknowledge truths, okay, and to focus on issues that impact English language teachers and association. The impetus for that was that there was an academic session at the 2018 convention, I think it was in Atlanta, in, in Atlanta that um, featured the use of the N-word. And the N-word is a derogatory word for Black people, specifically in the context of the United States. And so this was at our TESOL convention. And I can't remember the actual um, information in the session, but I know the N-word was used. And so members of minoritized groups, including Bell Class, the Black English Language Professionals and Friends Network and TESOL, started to voice concerns about issues of equity and inclusion within the association. They wanted to know how a session could get past anybody and how that session could be featured at our international conference. They also focused on uh, the lack of diversity in conference programs, specifically as featured or keynote speakers. Why is it, the question was posed, that very few of the uh, speakers were African-American or of African descent or Latino. The majority of the speakers were white, right? And so TESOL said, you know what? We are going to put to get pulled together a diverse voices task force. And that task force was made up of eight to nine diverse members from the association. Um, and it was convened in 2019 to investigate the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the association. The task force conducted research with peer organizations. They surveyed the TESOL membership and they held listening sessions with members from underrepresented groups within the association. And they also spoke with many of the affiliates. So here's what they found. And this in and of itself is a courageous conversation that we had to have as an organization. While I was having my courageous conversations in my classrooms at the university and my K through 12 ESL colleagues were having their courageous conversations in the context of their classrooms, we had to have courageous conversations as an association, as an organization that supports English language teachers around the globe, but also um, English language learners and their families. So some of the specific findings of the class task force, um, TESOL's membership is, was not as diverse as it could be. And so there was a need for more diverse representation, specifically in TESOL's leadership as well as the membership, right? 
only 13% of TESOL members identified as Black or African American, even though we knew that there's a large, we knew that there's a large population of teachers who could become members. And then only 10% identified as Hispanic or Latino. And so that was problematic and troublesome because we know the majority of the English uh, language learners in the context of the United States identify as Hispanic or Latino, yet these teachers are not a part of our membership. We also um, found that there was a need for a more inclusive culture within TESOL where all members would feel uh, welcome and respected. There was a need for more resources and support for members um, from underrepresented groups. We noticed that TESOL's leadership was not as diverse as it could be. For example, only 2% of TESOL's board of directors at the time identified as Black and only 4% identified as Hispanic or Latino. Now we know that there are a number of barriers that prevent members from underrepresented groups from getting involved in the TESOL International Association. These barriers included a lack of access to resources, um, financial resources, because it costs in order to be a member of the association. However, there's a new initiative now where um, we are providing memberships for um, specific uh, peoples so that they can make sure they're involved in the association. There's a lack of representation, as I mentioned earlier, in leadership, and people tend to like to see themselves in their leadership. And then there was a sense of feeling unwelcomed or excluded. And so we worked really hard to change that. We had the courageous conversation so that we could change these situations, right? So ultimately, the TESOL International Association Diverse Task Force recommendations were that we are going to create new, a new position of chief diversity officer to oversee these diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. We're going to develop a new DEI strategic plan. We'll invest in more resources and training for members on diversity, equity, and inclusion in language topics. And then we'll create more opportunities for members from underrepresented groups to become involved in the TESOL um, Association. Those were a few of our recommendations. I served actually as the co chair of the Diverse Voices Task Force. And so fast forward um, a few years, so this happened in 2019, now we're in 2023, and we have a strategic plan. And so in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, the TESOL strategic plan has laser focus on those areas. And so the goal is to increase the diversity of TESOL's membership as well as its leadership to create a more inclusive culture within the association and to provide more resources and support for members from underrepresented groups. And we also wanted to focus it on advocacy, to advocate for policy and practices that promote equity and inclusion in the field of TESOL. TESOL is committed to continuing its DEI efforts and creating um, a more equitable organization for all of its members and all of its affiliates like Costa Rica TESOL, right? The association believes that DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, okay, we have to add that A, DEIA, access, is essential for TESOL, for our organization, for our profession, to achieve its mission of advancing the quality of language education for all learners. So now we come to the time where we get to have some very, very courageous conversation. Um, and I can't see your questions or your comments at this time. So please make sure you put them in the chat. Um, but for professional associations like Costa Rica TESOL, like IATEFL, okay, how diverse and inclusive is your English language teaching organization? I have three questions for you, okay? Three questions that will lead to courageous conversations in your organization or your association. How do you ensure that your organization's leadership is diverse, right? How do you ensure that? 
how do you ensure that there is membership representation from all segments of your society, right? How do you ensure that? How do you recruit members? How do you reach out to the different segments of the population and say, hey, I know that you are teaching English and we need you to be represented in this organization, right? And then when they get there, how do you ensure that they feel a sense of inclusion and belonging in your organization? How do you get people from the southern part of Costa Rica, the northern part of Costa Rica, the western part and the eastern part to become involved equally in your association? So those are the questions for those of you who are in here who are members or in the leadership of a professional association. Association. It could be at the at a larger level, like the country, um, or it could be actually at a regional level. For school leaders, I know that we have some school leaders here today, right? I have some tough questions for you. We want to make sure that you're involved in these courageous conversations as well. And so I want to ask my school leaders, if you're in a leadership position at a school, right? Do you prefer native English speakers over non or over non-native speakers to become teachers at your school? If so, why? Because we know that there is a bias against non-native speakers of English. Okay? And that's not right. And so we need to think about um, these ideologies that we've espoused, right? Do you prefer whites over non-whites? Do you prefer whites over indigenous peoples, right? Or over blacks? Who are you hiring for English teaching positions and why? And there's a whole um, literature, uh, Mary Romney, who I mentioned earlier, she did a study where she actually surveyed um, positions, you know, announcements, vacancies for English language teachers around the world. And there were lots of ads who wanted white native speakers of English, right? What about black native speakers of English, right? What about Latino native speakers of English? Or what about just speakers of English, non-native or native? And so we have to think about who are we hiring for English teaching position? And I understand there are lots of variables that we must consider, okay? Do you have a preference for teachers with specific accents or and or dialects, right? So think about that. And what are the implications for teaching and what are the implications for learning? And again, I say that I understand that there are lots of variables um, and contextual factors that must be considered when we're asking these tough questions and having these courageous conversations. For university personnel like myself, I consider myself a university personnel. I work at a, at a college, at a university. Who are you recruiting and training to become English language teachers, right? Or ESL teachers or EFL teachers? Do you prefer candidates from certain uh, socioeconomic backgrounds? Do you have a preference for teacher candidates from a certain region of your country? Are you placing candidates in rural and marginalized areas to teach English, right? Again, this is very much um, based on context. And are you preparing candidates to embrace Maslow before they're jumping into Bloom? Do you, do you allow candidates to um, have opportunities to learn about affirming the identities of their English language learners? And for classroom teachers, of whom I think there are many on this call, how are you affirming, how are you inspiring, and how are you empowering your English language learners or your emergent bilinguals? Are you paying attention to Maslow's hierarchy of needs? It's great. We need to have a, a backpack, a toolkit of our strategies, of powerful strategies to teach the language. But how, are you, how else are you using the language to affirm their identities and inspire them and empower them, right? How are you allowing them to translanguage in the context of your classroom or is it strictly English in this classroom, 
Are you allowing them to use the various dialects of Spanish as they learn English? Are you showing a preference for one type of spoken English variety over another? What kind of materials are you using, right? And whose language, whose English is represented in the curriculum and the materials? If I look through the books, the textbooks that you're using, who are the people who are being um, identified as, as native speakers of English? What do they look like? Do they look like me, right? I consider myself a native speaker of English, right? Are there subtle um, biases or prejudices in those textbooks that you're using, in those materials that you're using? Are you using English to address the social justice issues that may impact your students now or in the future, right? And so these are some of the courageous conversations that we must have in the context of classroom. So, one of the quotes that I tend to share with my teachers, with my teacher candidates, when I tell them about Maslow and how it's so important to build connections with their students and affirm their students' identities as they're teaching them the language, is that a child cannot be taught by anyone who despises him or her. A child cannot be taught by anybody whose demand essentially is that the child repudiate his experience and all that gives him sustenance. And so it's important when we talk about language and when we talk about language teaching that we're willing to talk about language as not being apolitical, right? Because language teaching and language is very political, right? And we must make sure that we're not asking a child to give up their language, their own native language, their own experiences, their own culture and or cultures in order to learn and speak the English language. So I want you to think about this. And again, I want us to have this conversation. So I'm about to end. But what are some other courageous conversations that must be had in your English language teaching context? What are some courageous conversations that you need to talk about? What are some things that you can talk about in your school in terms of language learning and identities? So as I conclude, I leave you with a few recommendations from um, one of the papers that I wrote that was called The, um, the Illusion of Inclusion, Black um, English Language Professionals, right? The Illusion of Inclusion. Um, the first practice is to examine and critique your English language teaching curriculum and materials for diversity and inclusivity, not just the type of English, but also in terms of the faces of the people who represent um, English in the English language profession. Practice two, examine and critique hiring practices that disadvantage certain uh, professionals, certain English language teaching professionals, all right? So we need to look at who's actually doing the hiring and who's being hired. And hold English language teaching organizations accountable, accountable for who their memberships are and who's representing the entirety of the profession. And then the final practice is to use your privilege because we all have some privilege in some way or the other. Yes, I'm African-American, I'm a black American woman, I'm proud of that, but I also am privileged because I'm highly educated. I'm no longer impoverished, I'm no longer poor, I can afford some things that other can't, others can't afford. So I'm going to use my privilege to benefit the English language teaching profession by initiating these courageous conversations. Other people may not feel comfortable initiating these conversations. So I step in and I do that. And so I thank you. I thank you for having me here today um, to provide you with hopefully a little bit of affirmation and a little bit of inspiration as you go on to empower um, your, your students. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate this topic, bringing it up. It's very helpful, especially to be vulnerable, right, in our classes and help students feel that they are part of it and that they don't have to fit in. So there are a few questions. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we're going to open now. 
uh, the floor for questions. So for people, remember that you can type your questions in the chat and we will transfer them to our specialist. Please try to ask your questions as concisely as possible, please. While people write their questions, I already have some of them and some comments, so I'm going to start with them. Okay, we have Sergio's comments, and he says, we, ha we may have students who have come from different backgrounds, and some of them evidence special phonological features that may affect comprehension. Which feedback strategies would you suggest not to affect this student's self-esteem? Oh, that's a great one. Um, first, I think when you actually talk to students, you tell them everything, you know, your language is actually fine. There's nothing wrong with that. We're all diverse. I usually tell them, I, I compare it to AM, FM radio, right? And I tell them, uh, my students, I'm like, we can be on AM radio and FM radio. We have several different stations, okay? And so what I generally do is I allow them to use their phonological features, and that's fine. But then I have them practice. I have them emulate. So I might have them um, listen to someone else and try to mock the way that they speak. But ultimately, I'm making sure I'm affirming their identities by not telling them they can't use their phonological features or those phonological features are incorrect. I tell them that it's okay to have AM and to have FM, okay? Because we all have different stations, different varieties that we speak when we are with um, those who we love versus in a professional setting. So that's one of the strategies that I would definitely use. I use the normal strategies that most English language teaching professionals are um, aware of, but I, I, I provide love on top of it. I provide affirmation on top of it before we even get into, okay, let's practice it, saying it or doing it this way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's a comment here that says, standard languages have had a major impact on creating negative linguistic attitudes even towards native speakers who use some variation of their native languages. So I don't know, you want to say something or? I just want to tell Daniela is that she, she is absolutely correct. And my work and my research is about the negative um, language ideologies because they actually impact everything. They impact the self-esteem of, of children. You know, um, children think they can, I have black students in my classrooms and they don't see themselves as possibly being teachers of English because they speak black English. And so they have already um, internalized these negative ideologies and added attitudes about their language. So they um, give up an entire professional career because they don't think that they're good enough. Okay, thanks for your comment. There is another one from Angie. And it says, I think this could be adapted to our context. Like the presenter talked at the beginning with people who usually are outcast. Okay. Then we have Colton's comment. And he says, I've noticed other people of color in, the sa in my same position. Sorry, sorry. I've noticed other people of color in my same position are treated very differently and not welcome equally. Or I'm seen as more of an expert because I'm American, even though it's not true. Also, I have toned. Toned down my Southern accent to fit the standard American accent. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Colton, you're absolutely right. I'm Southern and American, so I feel you. I feel you. I understand. Mm -hmm. Then we have Susie's comment, and she says, I think right now we have the chance to involve and be more inclusive with the variety of accents and materials, resources we can find to practice the second language. Mm -hmm. There's an, uh, mm -hmm, another comment from Angie. Love this new concept of translanguaging. 
We have been instructed for years not to allow one, L1 within the class. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to talk too much, but Angie, you're absolutely right. We cannot, we, we have to make sure we affirm students' identities so that they don't think that they have to give up L1 in order to get L2. Wrong mm -hmm. idea. Uh, Perilis Cummins says, I agree. Materials resources say a lot about the inclusivity of the environment and instructor. Claire's Cummins says, remember, you only have one life, so, live, so live it the way you want to. Never let anyone else change who you are. Yes, Claire. We have Gloriela's comment. It says, years ago, one co-worker who was studying abroad mentioned that when he was asked, what is your profession? He said, I'm a tutor. He did not say he was an English teacher because of fear to be judged. Yep. Angie says, for Mrs. Brian, which would be your piece of advice for teachers who feel outcasted because of their background? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I wish I could get, connect with you later, Angie, because I have so much um, to share. I was there. Um, generally speaking, in the context of the United States, there aren't many Black um, English language teachers. So my thing is to love yourself and to see yourself as the expert that you are and to ignore all the noise in the background, to ignore them. Okay. And so you just have to do the very best for yourself and for your students. Thank you. Joanna says, well, that is a common situation with our Creole English in Costa Rica. It's for both teachers who speak Creole and go to a university to study English teaching. And the students who grew up speaking Creole who can understand you and could have a valuable experience, but they are afraid to speak. Yes, very parallel experience, yes. Angie says, and also as uh, someone who lived it and now as a professor, what can you tell us to encourage our students when they feel judged or made fun of since or, or made fun of since their accent accents are different? That they are special. Someone said it earlier. I can't remember her name. You only have one life to live. Um, God didn't make us to be all the same. And so embrace their accents because their accents are a part of who they are and a part of what their ancestors have given them. That is a gift. And that is a gift that they should embrace. Yeah, Claire was the one who said that. Yes, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Okay. And then Daniela uh, says, Limon Creole is a language, not English, or an English dialect. But you're right, they're marginalized because of their minori minority language. I guess there are no more questions, right? Or comments? So thank you very much. I don't know if there's anyone, any, something else you want to say? No, I just wanted to thank you all for having me and thank you for being a, an absolutely amazing audience. Hopefully, I can get a copy of the comments maybe a little bit later. Um, if you all want to reach out to me, please uh, contact Professor Anna and she will give you my contact information. I enjoy having these conversations so we can keep the conversation going. Thank you so much.